Cisco. My name is Sujit Ghosh. I'm a technical marketing manager in Cisco. I've been in Cisco for close to 20 years. It's going to be uh, 20 years in October for me. I look after the technical marketing team uh, in the enterprise network group and uh, working on wireless for almost 15 years. Started as a TAC engineer in security, so I kind of look between security and wireless. That's my specialty. That's where I focus on. So welcome to first topic for today is what are we doing on the Catalyst portfolio? Where are we? Last time, a year back when you were here, we started the journey on, uh, on Catalyst iOS on wireless, or what we call as Catalyst X Access Expansion to Wireless. Today, first session, we are going to focus on where we are with the journey. Pretty much, uh, if you look at it, tonight is a big day where we will literally finish the journey and have everything available. So the timing is perfect that way, okay? So that's what we're going to update you about. Where are we with this journey? Last year, Ankur presented to you all starting of the journey in November. We are here now. So we get these questions very much that why Catalyst? Why Catalyst? Where did we start with? But I want to reiterate that message again uh, over here. At the end, we all start with our hardware, with ASIC. We make sure we build our own ASICs, we design our own ASICs. We always focus now on a physical environment and virtual environment, all our software and hardware. And the most important part over here is powered by iOS XE. iOS XE has been around for many years, and now we are making sure that we are using the same software on our routing platforms, switching platforms, and wireless platforms. And we started this journey in last November, and we are quite ahead on this. And obviously, we have our management platforms, DNSE, which has open API for uh, third parties to open up and uh, build their own applications. So this is where we are with our journey on the Catalyst platforms. We start with our access points, our 9100 series access points. I'm holding one of them over here. There is a clear case version of this also available to look at all the antenna patterns and all of that, what we have internally. So that's where we started with, with our 98. These are our latest 11 AX access points. I'll go into little more details later. We have our platforms, the switching platforms, the access switches, the 9200, 9300, and the 9400, followed with the aggregation switches. And finally, we have our wireless LAN controllers, all named as 9800. So now we have the full platform or the portfolio, starting with the 9100 all the way to the 9800 controllers. I have a small version of this controller with me. This is the latest. We launched this literally on 1st of August, and, it's, uh, and, and it started shipping also. So this is the smallest member of this 9800 family, which we introduced, and that completes kind of the portfolio where we are. And obviously, we have our 9100 access points, DNS center to manage this complete portfolio, and we have DNS spaces, which is the evolution from CMX. This is the cloud version of imagining uh, DNS spaces is the cloud evolution of it came from the July systems acquisition. And all of these platforms are supported in, uh, in DNS spaces. Any questions? So here is the look at the complete family which we have now on the 9800 platforms. We introduced this in last November, 9800 AT, the largest controller. Then we have the second version of it, which is the 9840. And this is the latest addition to the family, which is the 9800L. And we have two form factors of this, because we got a lot of feedback from customers that how can we connect either via copper or fiber to my upstream switches? If I already have an infrastructure in place, do I need to rip and replace all the switches which I have? So that was a common feedback we got from a lot of our customers that can we have two versions of upstream? So that's the reason you have two pictures over here. 
I have one of them. I'm going to pass it around if you want to take a look at it. This is the latest hardware additions to the family. Excited to announce today that literally tonight, the code on Google platform on GCP will go live. That's what we are working on. We had a AWS uh, availability of the same software uh, for last six, eight, nine months. Tonight is we're going to finish off with uh, loading of the same software version on GCP or Google Cloud Platform. And obviously we have support for this in a private environment in your KVM uh, and, and VM environment and also support for your ENCS. I want to point out very clearly the scalability numbers are exactly the same between your private cloud as well as public cloud. So you can scale all the way up to 6,000 APs and 64,000 clients in a single instance if you want on AWS or in GCP, as well as in your private environment. So that's the main message over here that we now have the full portfolio or ready and available for customers to take advantage of on it. And obviously we have the 9800 controller embedded on our switches. We started with the 9300, then we have it on the 9400 as well as on 9500 platform. So all of these platforms do have now embedded controller availability. It's the same software, but one uh, thing you need to keep in mind, when we put the 9800 controller on these switching platforms, they are on the SDA mode. So you will be able to support those APs supporting VXLAN, et cetera. So they will be operating only on the SDA mode. I have that as a footnote somewhere. Moving on to our access points, we launched our 11 AX access points about four months back. And, and this is what we have in our portfolio, starting with the 9115, the 9117, and the 9120. I want to focus on probably the 9120 access points. This is where we introduced a new chip called the Cisco RF ASIC. That's over here in my uh, plexiglass version of this. This has all the secret sauce, what we are known for from a Cisco perspective on our RF design. This is called the Cisco RF ASIC. To start with, clean air which we acquired a company called Cognio back in 2007 or 2008. We have that available in all our access points till now and in future also will be available. Those are the secret, I would say, RF sauce which we have in our platforms. These access points also are multi-radio access points, and we'll go through more details of it in the next sessions with my, uh, uh, with my colleague Srini. This also has support for IoT readiness for IoT radios like Zigbee and Thread, and we will go through all the details as well as these access points in future will support containers for your, to host your IoT gateways. For example, if you want to run a Docker container and run some uh, uh, applications on it, you will be able to run that in future also. It, it says yes. it's um, IoT ready ZigBee. Has that actually got the radios in it to support that or is that an external module? Uh, so uh, you're talking about the ZigBee as well as the thing. It has the built-in radio on it, not modules. So you will be able to enable that on the thing. So there's, in fact, if you look at it, this is the AP over here, 9120. It just has an USB port. We don't know what we're going to do with that. It's for future. At least it has uh, the USB capabilities on it. But for ZigBee and for Thread, you don't need any other. It's all built into it. So it has multiple radios on it. Obviously, it has the two, five, four as well as five gig radios. It has the Zigbee radio. It has a BLE radio built into it, and also a third radio, which is basically this RF ASIC, which is going to help you in doing more monitoring in your network, passive monitoring in, in your network, intelligent in capture, etc. So it has lots of radios on it. I'll pass this around for you to look. Yes. A question, is there a uh, Stadium AX AP out there yet or coming soon? Uh, stadium version of APs, uh, so this AP 
will also be available on a uh, external antenna. So currently what we have now is internal antennas. They're going to be an external antenna version of this and followed with antennas which are needed for uh, stadium deployments. Yes, that's like a, coming. Like a P model? Correct, right. correct. That's coming, absolutely. So I just want to, Good question. because it's not clearly stated up there, that is Wi-Fi 6 or is um, uh, 8 AC? Uh, these are all Wi-Fi 6 APs. Okay. All of them starting you, from, okay. this is You said over here, you yes. mentioned over there, I wanted to be. These are our complete new portfolio yeah. of Wi-Fi 6 Perfect. access points. So all of these are Wi-Fi 6 11AX access points. And some of them are supporting 4x4 four four special streams. Some of them are supporting 8x8. Eight eight, and some of them are back on 4x4. Four, four but the important thing over here to understand, it's a minute thing, but it goes a long way for a lot of our customers, is they use the same brackets as they use in our older access points. That means if you have a customer who is running our 11 AC access points, 11 N access points, they don't have to replace the brackets when they are installing this new 11 AX access points and the power requirements, we kept the power requirements to, uh, to in an intelligent way. If you have a uh, good 30 watts of power available, you will get all the radio functionalities, but if, in case you don't have a switch gives you 30 watts, you still will be able to operate this in a lower, it'll fall back to a two by two mode, for example. So there will be a lot of customers who might not have upgraded the switch <coughs> infrastructure yet, but we made sure that we will operate the APs in a low power mode also. It will just fall back to a two by two mode. Questions? Nope. Okay. So looking at the complete picture now about our 9100, where are we focusing in Cisco? Where are uh, our uh, roadmap taking us? First thing, is resiliency, and we know this very well. Anybody who is deploying wireless network is now having wireless as a primary medium of access, especially if you are looking at a healthcare deployment in a hospital. You barely have a downtime for an hour, maybe in a year, and the network needs to be up and running. So we are doing significant amount of enhancements on this area on resiliency. Second top of mind topic for every customer is security. How can we make sure that our wireless network is secure? That's our second big topic. And finally, intelligence. That means what kind of data can I get from the network? Starting with what can I uh, do with DNA assurance? How can we use intelligent capture as one of the features and functionalities we introduced in DNA Assurance to work with all of these platforms? And IoT is our next big focus area, and Srini is going to talk about what we are do, planning to do on it. Keep in mind, all of, all of these platforms are running iOS XE, as well as they have the open config model. So we will be able to use the NetConf Yang models to get all configuration and telemetry data from all of these platforms. Question. Are the DNA intelligent capture functionality, is it the same across the board for all these APs or do different APs have different capabilities as far so, as- So very good question. So all the intelligent capture functionality which we added in our 11AC Wave 2 APs will be carried over to this new platform. So from a, a user perspective, you will not use, or an admin perspective, you don't have to bother about. So all the functions which we had on our other APs will be carried same over, across same board. across the board. We are starting with that and we are not dropping any features and functionality. This will, we'll keep on enhancing on it. But we start at the exact same level as our 11AC Wave 2 APs and these APs. Yeah. So ICAP is a basic. On the zero downtime software upgrades, yep. how, how exactly is that working? And I will cover that in detail. Just give me two minutes. That's my next slide probably, okay? So uh, finishing off that, uh, and all of these access points powered by Wi-Fi 6, which you, ta which you uh, 
which you asked about, and also support for GCP. So this is our complete family and focus areas moving forward. Okay. So let's talk about interoperability. Uh, Wi-Fi is not only about an AP and a controller. Every customer I visit, they have to have a radius server in place. They have to have some management in place, as well as we have support for on, on our platforms like CMX and DNS spaces. <coughs> so 16.12 is the latest software which was posted uh, about a week back on CCO. This is the third revision of the software on these platforms. We started with 16.10, 16.11, and 16.12. Moving forward, 16.12 is going to be our long-term release. MD release, if you're used to that, uh, concept 16.12 is going to be the MD release. But I wanted to show over here that what are the interoperability matrix for this. It'll work with all our 11AC Wave 1, Wave 2 APs, all our 11AX APs. It'll work on all our platforms as well as it is operatable with DNAC version 1303 to be precise. We test and make sure that all the use cases for identity service engine is supported. Also, this is very important, a lot of customers around the world has Cisco Prime. If they might upgrade their Cisco Prime to the latest version of 3.7, they will be able to operate with our new controllers. So the latest controllers which I showed you, which came out uh, last week, the 90, uh, 800L, they will be able to monitor those, configure those from their Cisco Prime. Obviously, it is supported on DNSE, but we made sure that we have that backward compatibility available. Yeah. Any questions on this? So is that a one or the other, DNA or Prime? So you can't go do some in DNA and then do some in Prime? Uh, at, at this point, I would suggest that you can have both of them, so DNA, can manage uh, your controller, uh, as well as Prime can manage it, but only have one of them manage it. That means own it in terms of configuring it. So you should use either Prime to configure it and use DNA to monitor it, or you can have it other way, that have DNA Center to configure it as well as monitor it you can just keep on monitoring from your prime also. But we have only one person, or that means either DNS Center or Prime, have the read-write capability on the box. That would be my suggestion at this point. Okay. Okay. So this is the, uh, so the latest platform, which we, uh, I wanted to just show it to you all, and this is for your reference. We have the copper and the SFP version of it, so that uh, we can have the flexibility at the customer side. You don't have to upgrade your switching infrastructure right away to it. Interestingly, it has an M gig port also on it, and, and the scalability numbers, I'm not going to. So this can support up to 250 access points, five gig of it, and it has full support for HA. You can put them side by side on a small tray and have the full functionality available on it, okay? Would that be the equivalent of the 3504, but in the Catalyst line of control? Absolutely, so if you look at it, over here, I have a 3504 controller. It's, if you, uh, it's just the same size form and factor. exact yeah. form factor as, as the 35. So purposely, we brought this in to, to, good you asked this question. Yes, it is going to be the IOX XE version of a 3504 controller. So for small deployments, you would recommend either going with the, uh, the new 9800L or maybe like a, a cloud version or like on? So for your branch offices deployment, you have, uh, depending on the size of your branch, how many APs you need on it, you have the option of either going cloud or you're having flex connect mode or you have the option of putting this uh, hardware in your branch offices. So you have, okay. it all depends on the scalability numbers of your, if you're looking for a high school, for example, which requires anywhere between 100 to 200 access points in the campus itself, uh, probably look into one of this. 
to be in the, uh, in the campus and have a backup controller in your data center. So if you lose that hardware, it can fall back or have a pair of this. But if it's a really small branch office, which is kind of has only requirement 5, 10, 15 access points, this may be an overkill over there. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Thank you. So again, a quick look at our uh, platforms uh, on it, uh, all the way to 6,000 APs uh, on, on, uh, on the physical environment as well as on the uh, uh, virtual environment support. So let's now focus a little on the resiliency part of it. This is uh, probably you have seen this information last time, but I wanted to uh, again go through it because we have gone a long way on this journey. First of all, we started with support for SSO, or in this case, what we are talking about Standby, that means active and uh, uh, standby, where you can have two of these controllers connected back to back. We sync the database between the two, and if you lose one of the controllers, the second controller takes over. That's the starting point of it. We always supported that. N plus one, redundancy. But the important things what we have started over here is the journey on patching. Because a lot of times now, if you open up a TAC case or if there is a PCERT, we have to give you a new software version. That means you have to take down the complete network, make sure you reinstall that software. The APs have to go in and download the software. So it's a complete process. And customers do not have that time. And also at the same time, if you're in a hospital environment, every time I give you a software, you have to make sure that you test it in an environment to make sure that nothing else is affected. So this takes time. So what hot patching gives us is where we will be able to install a bug fix or a PCERT fix without rebooting the controller. But in case if it is a fix, which touches the kernel of the software, we might need a reboot of the controller. But that's, that's where we have to make a decision that, OK, then we have a downtime. And the good part is, if you have a controller in an HA pair, we can install that patch on the primary controller, and it will get co copied onto your backup controller. But hot patching is mostly when you don't touch the kernel of the software. You can get a quick fix while the, and I'll show you a quick demo of this at the end. Question. And the access points don't need to be rebooted. The access points need not be rebooted. Right. Your clients will be connected, and, and I'll show you as part of the quick demo on it. Yes. But restarting, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to restart some services, and that could be client impacting, couldn't it? Uh, it did, again, yes, it could be. Depends on the type of the fix on it. Uh, uh, both, but hot patching will not require any of those other uh, things. So the clients should be going on. If it is impacting the clients, it will land up to be a cold patch. In that case, but it will restart some of the services, which might affect uh, the, uh, uh, the rebooting of the controller or the AP or some services, which is basically uh, uh, doing the PEM state, we call it, the PEM state engine of the clients. I'm what? thinking of cases where you would need like a specific service on, on the access point to be rebooted, but it's not, it doesn't need to, it's not affecting the core. Correct. So I have a solution for that, and that is my, you lead me to a very nice uh, this thing called the flexible per site update. So this update which we are talking about, this is going on the controller. Similarly now, what we are doing is we have the functionality now to apply those bug fixes and whatever we want to call uh, the, our updates on AP also directly. And how you do that, I'll show you in two minutes, okay? And that's, that leads to a very good question uh, that what is this AP device pack? Currently, for last 10 years when we are using AirOS, every time we came out with a new AP model, we asked our customers to upgrade the controller code. You have to go to the latest code. But customers may not be comfortable going because they have certified it. So now we have introduced a functionality called AP device pack. For example, we came out with a new AP. We'll give you a device pack with you, which means that if you are happy with, say, 16.10 code, and this is supposed to be supported in 16.12 only, and you're not ready to upgrade to 16.12, we'll give you a small file or a device pack, 
which will allow you to make these APs join your 16.10 code, serve your clients your SSIDs so that you can test all your devices. You might not get all the features and functionalities, but the basic operation of the AP will happen so that you can make sure that the AP is suitable for your environment. It's broadcasting your all SSIDs and also your clients are connecting to it. And then when you're comfortable with 16.12, you can migrate over there. Now, how, Question. How does that work though? Because you're talking about not all of the features are available. So Correct. Uh, that seems to me like it's just a, going to be a potential big pain problem for users. Correct. So what, what I mean by that is, say for example, 11AX or Wi-Fi 6 is compatible, backward compatible with 11AC Wave 2 and 1, right? So in this case, if say 16.11 or 16.10 do not have the code to support Wi-Fi 6, the APs will now operate almost like, imagine it as a 11 AC wave two access points, the data rates which will be supported, et cetera, will be on a 11 AC wave two. Now when you upgrade to 16.12, it will operate now on the full 11 AX capability. That goes capability. against your whole point though, of being able to test the access point with your clients if I can't operate the full features of the AP. Absolutely. So it, we have to make a call over there that what is it? A lot of customers came back. To, I just want to check if my SSIDs are getting broadcasted properly or not. If my APs are, uh, are being uh, held into the same area, the coverage patterns of it, do I need to do a re-site survey of it or not, those type of environments on it. But if you're looking at 11AX testing only, and you have bought 100 laptops, then probably it's not that environment, then you have to upgrade your code to 16.12. But a lot of customers just want to say, how is my coverage pattern? How is my uh, security? Is it working properly with my radius servers? All my SSIDs are getting broadcasted. I have been to a customer site when we put a new AP and suddenly one AP, one SSID vanished. Like when we were struggling, because we stopped supporting static web at one point of time, for example. We, we have a surprise. Why this SSID is not getting broadcast? And this, this AP device pack goes yep. on the controller? Yes. It goes on the controller, but you can apply this on a per site. And I'll have that one slide to show it to you. A right per ahead. site? Or can you, could it be like per AP group? or? AP group is the older concept which we had on our OS controller. That has been migrated to a site concept in the 9800. So it's the same thing. It goes either in an AP group type of a concept or on, on it. And I have a slide to show that. Question, please. Uh, I know it doesn't exactly fit here, but I just don't want to forget it either. Um, it was being talked about a little bit on Twitter. On the 9800s, is there any difference with like the 1815s and the provisioning of the switch ports versus the oddball way it gets done on the 8540s? No, no, that, that not is, at all. That is just horrible. Just, yeah. just feedback for yeah. you. The, it, okay. It's just not good. Okay, okay. Not, not aware of it at all. Okay. Not aware of it. Thank you. Okay. So let's look at the uh, HA in detail. So we have full support for back-to-back -back connectivity. I have picked up the latest one on the 9800L. Similarly, for 40 and 80, we have the connectivity. We introduced a very important concept over here also, which is unique in the industry, is full HA support on a VM environment. We made sure that we can have full HA, including AP SSO and client SSO. If you have two VM instances, we will be able to. This was not available in our AirOS controllers. As a result, there's tremendous amount of interest from a lot of our customers to support HA in a VM environment, also full HA in a VM environment. That's what I wanted to quickly mention over here. So updates, going back, there are two, three types of updates. One is the controller update, or what we call as SMU, or software maintenance update. Then we have something called the AP service pack. And then the final thing is the AP device pack. AP service pack is where we are sending out the bug fixes and all, which is going to be applied only onto the AP. And AP device pack is where you are adding a new model of this, uh, of the new access points on it. And these are independent. These goes, controller updates goes on the controller. 
AP update goes from the controller to the APs. Obviously, the AP device pack goes from the controller meant for this thing. But the key message over here is we have decoupled the AP image from the controller image. That means you can run a different version of the controller image. You can have a different software running on the AP. Is the provisioning concept still there? Provisioning concepts, yes. Yes, absolutely. You will be able to same, use the same provisioning methods on moving forward. In fact, if you look at uh, this, all of this has some tags also built into it. So you will be able to use some of our applications to get the data or the apps to use you for uh, provisioning. So all of these APs will come with that effect. So if you're running a different version on the AP to the controller, yes, and you hit a bug, is the first thing going to come back? You need to have them both on the same version. Um, or, so or is it yes, with the two different versions. Very good question. So there will a process in place in Cisco for we have this available of this uh, patching in controllers for in our routers for a long. Uh, so there is a SMU governing body with within Cisco who will give you all that information or tell us, guide us that what type of patches should go where, and this will all be documented uh, moving forward. Here, we are now focused on creating this infrastructure, which can help us in building this for you all. So managing all these APs and controllers, how would you know when to apply which patch? Like, we would have like a notification in the controller interface or something? Like, how v Very good question. So two ways, uh, uh, the most important one will be from DNS Center. So DNS Center, if it is managing all your controllers and AP, will have that information. There's a functionality on DNS Center called SWIM, software management portion of it. SWIM will be reading all your controller information and also have a connectivity to, say, Cisco.com, and will be able to tell you that, hey, you are out of sync, or this is your golden image. You should apply this in this controller. It is missing on this one. So SWIM functionality on DNS Center will be able to help you with that. So what if you don't have DNS Center? DNS Center, if you don't have it, then you go back to uh, controller. So all of this uh, features and functionality which I'm talking about will be available on the controller also. So you will be able to apply these patches, see what type of patches is there. Uh, available on it, all the detailed information is going to be in, in the controller UI. So you will be able to see all that from the controller UI. Okay. okay. Well, will that also, when it tells you that there's uh, patches or updates, would also yep. tell you straight away whether it's a hitless or a no outage upgrade? Or do you have to go through, read 400 pages of release notes no. to find that information? No, we, we, that's not the plan. That's not the plan. It will tell you that, hey, this is the cumulative patch over there. So after a certain t uh, period of time, we will say that, okay, we cannot give more any more patches. We need to upgrade you to the next software level. All right. That's the plan. Okay. And the good thing is, this is already in place for ISR routers and all. We are not reinventing or adding anything. So, so one, of our, one of our customers' biggest things is, Scheduling the um, the upgrades because it because it does have that because it does have that upgrade uh, or that outage. Yeah. Um, so how how was when the controller does need to reboot? How are we getting a zero outage? Is there a method there? Yes, I will get to that. Give me one minute on it. Question. This in no way would allow me to take a legacy site and bring it onto a site that's current. Like when I say legacy, I mean some old. Air OS? Well. Yeah, can you hold on to that thought? <laughs> can you hold on to that thought? I have some slides for that. I can hold I, on. Yeah. So all of this, I want to more point out, uh, all of this process underlying happens with a feature and functionality called rolling AP upgrade. So whenever we apply the patch, anything we will be doing. So we will not take down your network completely. We use the RRM information or radio resource manager information within the controller to find out how many APs you have in that area how many clients are connected to this, and send out 11 RKV, or mostly V, uh, information to the clients to get your clients off an AP and have a rolling fashion of updating those patches. So we will not take down your network completely. And you can select that, how what percentage of your neighbors will go down, 5%, 15%, or 25%. If you do five, it'll take longer to go through the upgrade. That's where we are going to start off with. Okay. 
So here is a look at the APSP. This is really useful. Say in an environment, we introduce a new AP, we come across some issues. Currently, if you come across an issue, we have to give you a new software. You have to install it in the controller, reboot the controller, and make sure that you apply that patch. Now what we can do is, say for example, we came across an issue with our 2800 and 3800 access points in this case. So now you have three sites, A, B, C, and they have these APs, 28 and 3800, and they're all running out of the same controller. Okay, keep in mind. So now you can say that I'm going to apply the patch only on my 2800, 3800 APs, leave everybody else, or you can decide, say that I'm going to apply it on site B, but only on the 2800s, and then you decide if you want to put it in site C or not. But all of this operation is happening while the AP and the controller is up and running. You are not taking down the controller, only applying the patch on the AP itself. So the key message is we are decoupling the strong requirement between an AP and a controller. Can you detect if something is going wrong after uh, patching the AP and then rolling back? Or Absolutely. Absolutely. So you have the functionality on it over here called, uh, uh, in, uh, I say, activate and commit. So once you do an activate, this is when you are testing it out. But if you are happy with the patch, you can do a commit so that when you reboot, everything remains on it. I'm glad you asked this question. But if you are not happy with it, there is always an option over here to say, deactivate or uncommit on it. So you will be able to take that patch or roll back that patch. Isn't that wonderful? That yeah. you can go back to TAC and say that, hey, you give me the fix, it didn't fix my problem, give me another fix. You uncommit the fix. Hmm. So finally, this is uh, another example where you have two buildings and you are going through this scenario where you are adding new APs. Cisco comes with a new AP. You're using the same controller. You just apply the device pack over here and you will be able to make those APs join your existing controller and you don't have to take down your network. And this is something for last 10 years or more customers have been asking for that how can we make sure that we support the new APs without going through the full upgrade process. Second area of focus, obviously security. What are we doing What security? Rogue detection, intrusion prevention, definitely part of it. WPA3, we are ready for WPA3. 16.12 code posted last week supports WPA3, both on ARS as well as on 9800, but I want to make sure that we are ready for it. <coughs> ETA, which we added on our switching platform, so encrypted traffic analysis, extended to wireless. IPSK, identity PSK, which was added on our ARS platforms and uh, being used by few of our customers, we will support that from day one. BYOD, all the use cases for BYOD, which we have derived in last eight, nine, uh, five, six years, are supported on day one. And obviously, all of these platforms are part of SD access. So you will be able to do the segmentation in your network from day one. With Identity Appreciate Key, have you come up with an onboarding system at all? Uh, yes, very good question. And that's something we are actively working on. Stay tuned. We'll, uh, Ankur is from the product management team. He, uh, it's one of our top focus area, how to work on the onboarding systems on this thing. Yes, underlying work is going on. I have a question from yeah. Peter, actually. Um, yeah. So here we're talking a lot about the Catalyst you know, new lineup. Yeah. Uh, what do you have any updates on the AirOS side? Because you know a lot of your customers are probably still running AirOS. Absolutely, absolutely, and I have an update on that. Okay, all right. That's my next slide. Uh, so a lot of this is, is adoption. How we are looking between the two. So a couple of ways we are. We, if a customer is interested on the 9800 platforms, I am walking them with this scenarios where we are talking about hardware, software, what they want what they have, do they have the right uh, platforms in their network? Do they, have, do they want to go down appliance or virtual? Do they want, how do we migrate the configuration? 
how do we do the configurations on it and have an important thing called IRCM. This is what we are talking about is AROS, how we can interpret with our AROS systems, as well as then what are the definite configurations you need to do on this new system so that it doesn't, uh, I would step on each other, okay? So what we are suggesting in this case is a scenario like this. So existing customer who has a couple of buildings available, all being managed by an AROS controller right now, right? They need to upgrade to say 8.8 .8 MR1, that's the latest software, and then introduce if needed the 9800 controllers, and at the same time, if they have an anchor controller or a DMZ controller, they can upgrade that controller to the, uh, to the new version of the software, keep the same platform. So this could be an AROS platform. So now you have the option of running Ethernet over IP tunnel, which was supported in our AROS controllers. But at the same time, run CAPWAP tunnel from the new controllers. You don't have to throw away all your controllers on it, and then create this same mobility group or group name, and you have this AP groups concept on your uh, AROS controller, the new concept of policy tags and RF tags, and then you start migrating your APs one by one from this controller to the controllers. So that's what we are planning to do, this full interoperability. Keep in mind, all of these new APs, the 11 AX APs, are also supported in our 11 or our AROS controllers. So all the APs which we introduced 15, 17, and 20, they are supported on all our AROS controllers now with the 8.9 and 8.10 software versions coming on it. So that should be the answer if somebody is asking about, and we have full interoperability between the two. Yeah, I think they were more asking about, you know that the iOS uh, XE brings you a lot of more flexibility so Correct. you can implement new features. Correct. I think the question is, you know, which of these new features are also being implemented on the AROS side? And Very good question. So yeah. all I have shown you till now on the features and functionality is going to be only on the 9800 side. Yeah. The, the, and the AROS side, we are adding device support of 9800, but the yeah. HA and all the new features which I showed you will not be part of the but, AROS. What about WPA3? And WPA3, yes, I mentioned about that. Absolutely, yes. 8.10 software version will have support for WPA3. Absolutely. So, so there's no plans to end of life AROS at this, at this stage? Uh, I'll leave my uh, uh, esteemed uh, PM colleague to answer that. Uh, if you ask me today, uh, it, 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 it will happen one day. But if you ask me today, that is there a date for it? No. If I can use it, it'll be two months from now or two years from now, nobody knows. We want to make sure that the adoption of 9800 happens properly. We made a lot of effort to make sure that the feature parity and all of that is taken care of on the 9800 platforms. We want to go down that path uh, over there and make sure the customers are comfortable with it. We have done work to have this full interoperability with the, with the platforms. So if a customer has recently bought the 5520, 8540, or the 3504 controllers, they will have support for uh, full interoperability on it. So I have to ask, how do you uh, reconcile stability with the new features on like 8.10? I mean, is it going to be the gold star code or is it going to be adventure code or use at your own risk or? No, so uh, uh, we are already on the third release of the code, 16.10, 16.11, and 16.12. No, on the, 80, on the AROS. So on the AROS side, 8.10 is going to be the next MD release. So we will have multiple software versions available on 8.10. 8.5 Five currently is our MD release, which has five and, and, and we are using that in many, many uh, events and locations, 8.5. But if a customer is using our 11 AX access points, they have to go to either 8.9 today and 8.10 is the long-term uh, next MD release plan, which has multiple MDs planned after that. So that being said, is 8.9 considered not 
Uh, 8.9 is uh, whenever we introduce a new AP, we go through like an 8.8 or an 8.7. It's kind of the interim release to get the hardware support on it. So we have mentioned clearly in CCO that if you have 11AX AP, you use 8.9. Otherwise, you don't have any uh, reason to use 8.9. But ultimately, we want everybody to be on 8.10, which has plans for multiple releases on it. Okay. I have a question from Twitter. Are you yep. uh, uh, looking at implementing IPSK under WPA3? Uh, I do, uh, WPA3. So WPA3 is a whole new bo ball game, and and all the features and functionalities of that is is going to be there. But the real uh, intersection of IPSK and WPA3. Yes, so maybe I can take that question. Yeah. So IPSK yeah. with WPA3 is in the plans. Okay. We are working on it. So the next release which should be coming out should support IPSK with WPA3 also. Okay. Thank but that's, yes, that's work in progress. Okay, so similar example for if you have a building with multiple floors on it, you will be able to do that. Also then migrate the same process. And final thing before I get up stage is the tool. We have a tool available in the in CCO called uh, called the migration tool, which will help us now with customers to take an AROS configuration Put it in this, and it's available to everybody. This will convert all our configurations from AirOS to 9800. It will tell you what are the supported configs and what are the translated configs. Uh, because we move to this new OS, there may be situations where some commands doesn't make sense, or the way we uh, configure an interface is different in AirOS compared to iOS. We will be able to show that information directly over here. The migration tool, does it produce like a report of whatever? It literally uh, helps you in, uh, in creating another uh, text file. So it will show you clearly within the text file that what was the com uh, configuration on AROS and what are the configurations on, on iOS XE. And it has different sections on it, which tells you that what is the translated config, what is the unsupported, not applicable, and unmapped config. And then you you put your old config into the migration tool, you crunch it, yep. you get the errors, the translated, the yep. unsupported, and whatever. Yep. And then what? So what we have done is the next step is we have taken the same tool, put it on the controller itself. So on the 9800 controller, we have embedded the same tool. So now you can take the AROS controller configuration, put it into your 9800 controller, and do the same tool conversion of it. And if you like the output, you can just say apply. It will apply all your translated configurations from AirOS to 9800 on the box itself. But is there a way that you can apply whatever you got from migration tool that you might have edited because? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you can throw the What do you don't like? Yeah. The migrated config that you might have corrected and apply it straight Absolutely. to the controller instead of using the migration tool that's embedded. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the reason we provided it in, all, uh, in. And this is also included in Prime. So we have included this in three places, uh, on CCO, on, on the box itself, and also on Prime. You can take your existing configuration. It will convert that for you. Okay. Prime 3.7? 3.7. We started with 3.5. 3.7, I'm telling, because that is where we have support for 11 AXAP. That's where we are. OK, thank okay. you. Uh, Shrini, you want to come and connect your laptop in the meantime? I'll take the question. I see that you've got yeah. uh, um, corresponding AROS to uh, the 9800 uh, mm -hmm. CLIs. Is there an actual document somewhere that actually shows you all of them? So Absolutely, the other... yes. I will point it out to the group. There is, a, for every command, and I went through this, every command, there are about 3,000 commands on AirOS, and what is the corresponding command on iOS XE? There is a CCO document available which walks you through that, all of them. I, I'll point it out. I'll put it on the, uh, uh, the uh, chat window or wherever you want it. Uh, it's in CCO. Yeah. Quick question. Do you know yep. when the AOS 9.10 uh, code will be released? Uh, 8.9 is already there now. 8.10 I 8 was 10 should be coming out in September. September? September? Okay. Yeah. That will have support for the, uh, and it's going to be the long one. He's getting set up over there. Any other questions for me? The migration tool that you keep on Prime and the migration tool that's available on CCO and the one that's available on the controller, 
do you like when you update it? When you update the the migration tool on CCO, do yep. you systematically uh, release a patch for the for the controller and Prime? Absolutely, and there is a program in place, and I'm fully involved in that. So every software release which will come out, 16.10 to 11 and 16.12, for example, as we add new features and functionalities on it, there is a complete program in place which will take care of those updates also. So with every major release, we will update the tool. This is on CCO, this can be done easily, but built-in tool will be associated with 16.12, 16.11, and this thing, and it's a program is in place. Every software feature, uh, main release, will have the tool updated on it. Because, it could, well, you, you can see the concern. Where, yep, absolutely. You know, I mean, I have the wrong version of migration tool, and I implement something. Absolutely, so it's, that's the reason I would say starting point would be the CCO version, because it's easier to update, but then move on with the other embedded version.